Good evening and a warm welcome to everybody uh, on this book club session. Well, uh, you know, just to introduce the topic of what we're going to be talking about today, the Himalayas don't really need an introduction. All of us, no matter where we are in the subcontinent, are connected with it in some form or the other. It's larger than life in, in every respect. It's part of our myths, it's part of our folklore, and it's part of our history. But there's a lot more to this mountain range than the fact that it is the tallest range in the world and hence famous across the world. There are different facets to it. And Stephen Walter's book, uh, Wild Himalayas, A Natural History of the Greatest Mountain Range of the World, tells the story of the many layers that make the Himalayas. Stephen joins us from uh, Lando and Missouri. Uh, Stephen, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Mimi. Stephen, you know, uh, I'm so happy that I got introduced to your work through this book because I hadn't read you before. And, and that also tells you how myopic our own view of history is because there is no way of understanding history if you don't understand the geography, ge geology, and uh, the formation of such an important uh, mountain range in India's uh, north. Uh, but I'm going to start by asking you, this is really... Uh, product of a lifetime of journeys, of, of research, of learnings, because what you've done through this book is you've interspersed it with stories about your own travels and also brought to light the work done by a whole generation of naturalists, geologists, uh, um, people who have studied various facets of the Himalaya. So a, a quick word about how this came about. Well, I think... Um... You know, I was born in the Himalaya, I grew up in the Himalaya, I've been part of the Himalaya for all of my life. And uh, so in a sense, it's a, it's a book that uh, started as soon as I began to sort of explore and understand uh, the place that I call home. Um, over the years, I've, I've looked at so many different aspects of the Himalaya, but I think the thing that has fascinated me the most is the natural history of the mountains. Uh, you know, there's obviously the political history, there's uh, cultural history, there are all kinds of stories that can be told about Himalayas uh, in, in, in various different contexts. But for me, the, the fascinating thing is uh, talking about the Himalaya as a living landscape, as a place that uh, supports life, uh, and in a sense, is constantly changing, because it's alive. It's not, uh, this is not a static environment. This is not a, uh, you know, set in stone, but rather it is evolving uh, even as we speak. So for me, that's the most fascinating part about it because it's, it's not something that is, is in, uh, you know, immutable or forever. In fact, it's constantly in flux. Mm. You know, uh, and, and I think uh, it's also, uh, uh, an environment which is in increasing threat also, which we will come to uh, in a bit. But I'm going to start at the very origins of the Himalayas. Stephen, we all have learned about uh, how the uh, Indian landmass went and collided with um, Asia and the fold mountains created the Himalayas. But that's a simplistic understanding of it, because what I didn't realize was there were multiple phases to this, uh, to this journey of the creation of the Himalayas. There are hints of that even today, but before I come to the hints of that today, uh, take us through the what really happened. What is the latest, you know, research pulled out on the various stages of the formation of the Himalayas? Well, I think one of the interesting things for me when I started working on this book is that I, I began with a story that I assumed was uh, sort of coherent and uh, established, which was that. Uh, through continental drift, uh, the landmass that is India uh, collided with Asia, and then as it collided, it pushed up the mountains of the Himalaya. But what, what was interesting for me as I, I read some of the um, geological accounts, uh, some of the research that has been done over the last uh, 50 to 15 years, uh, what I what I gathered was that, in fact, people really don't have a clear idea as to what actually happened. I mean, we know that the continents collided, we know that they pushed the Himalaya up, but 
if you ask a geologist, you'll get answers that vary from 100 million years ago to 25 million years ago, which is a huge span of time. And it's obvious that you know, there, there's a lot of uncertainty around the creation of the Himalaya. At the same time, I think basically the narrative is fairly clear in that you know, these two land masses came in contact with each other, pushed the mountains up, and uh, that's what we have today. The question is, did it all happen bang at once? Did it happen slowly over time? Did it happen in stages? We don't know. And I think geologists are still debating that. But nevertheless, what is critical about it is that essentially parts of the Earth's crust uh, came from different regions of the globe, came together, collided, and created this uh, tremendous uh, natural phenomena that we uh, call the Himalaya. Mm. That's very interesting because I, I don't understand that. So there are two aspects to this, uh, Stephen. The first is that you've spoken about how even before the collision where the continents collided, there was a deep uh, rift that was created. The tidal sea kind of uh, uh, flew into that. There were lots of unnamed channels of rivers. And that is why the bedrock of the Himalayas are made of the sediments carried by these many unnamed channels, which kind of drained into this rift. Uh, uh, explain, uh, 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 explain that to us. And also the fact that when you say that there were, uh, you know, things that came from all over the world to create the Himalaya, what do you really mean by that? Well, uh, let me, first of all, uh, uh, offer a disclaimer that I'm not a geologist, I'm a storyteller. So, right. <laughs> so what, what, I'm, what I'm giving you is, 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 is in a sense a condensed uh, narrative that is, is in a sense meant to try and uh, interpret what geologists uh, are, are struggling with in terms of how did this mountain range uh, come about. The word orogeny is a wonderful word. It's the how mountains were formed, the formation of mountains. So orogeny as a, as a term fascinates me on, on many levels. But basically, yes, as you said, there was this Tethys Sea, which was uh, formed out of uh, a, a gap between two land masses. Uh, it may have been quite shallow at one point. And then as the land masses came together, it, it was pushed down, so it became deeper. Uh, it was full of aquatic life, crustaceans and others. And then as the continents came together, the remains of that aquatic life, uh, coral, uh, clams, other sort of uh, crustaceans um, had died and, and sort of settled on the surface and that became limestone and ultimately then that gets pushed up. But that's sort of simplistic because what, I think the way that I've tried to describe it and, and it's a, perhaps a simplistic analogy is that you take a deck of cards. If you take a deck of cards out of a pack, um, it's all neatly arranged and in order. But then as you begin to shuffle it, uh, it is disordered then let's say you take the two halves of the deck, you turn them around. So some of the cards will be facing this way, some will be facing that way. You shuffle them again and it goes on. Then if you make it more complicated, you turn them sideways, they get even more shuffled. So the strata of the Himalaya represent this tremendous shuffling because when continents collide, there's what's called subduction. So one section may go under the other. But then as this goes over, another section may go over it. So the challenge for geologists is they, they see all these strata in the Himalaya, but they don't know which is the most recent and which is the oldest, because you'll have an older section of the mountains lying on top of a younger section of the mountains. And the puzzle is how do you figure out, okay, what is what? Because obviously the limestone is one of the youngest uh, pieces of this puzzle. But when you stand on top of Everest, Mount Everest, you're standing on top of limestone. So how did that get up there above 8,000 meters 
when there's much older granites and other uh, 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 strata that are, are lower down. So these are the puzzles, I, and I apologize to geologists because I'm, I'm simplifying.